Well, good morning, church family. He is our living hope. Amen to that? Amen. Hey, before we get started, I want to pause and just thank you for your continual generosity to give faithfully to First Baptist Bernie. I know it's the beginning of summer and we, we've got a lot going on, right? And so we've got... Uh, multiple trips on the mission field right now and vacation Bible school coming up and camps coming up. You just need to understand it's your faithful generosity that allows us as a church to, to be able to do all of that. And so at the beginning of summer, um, I know you're gonna go on vacation. There's gonna be weeks you're in and you're out. Just two quick things for you. One, if you could just commit and plan to be faithful in your giving this summer. And two, if you would consider, if you're not already, maybe giving online because it helps keep us consistent during the summer. That said, turn with me in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter nine. 1 Corinthians chapter nine. Now I have to ask your permission this morning, okay? Uh, as we jump into this text, I need your permission to stretch you, okay? Not, not every sermon is going to be this theologically heavy or complex, okay? But this sermon this morning is, and so I want you to plan on it. I need your permission to be stretched. And the, the reason this is so important, the topic we're talking about, I teased it last week, I'm gonna set it up here in a second, right? But it is so good and right for us to roll up our sleeves and to be able to think theologically, biblically, because that truth, guys, is being attacked by the world every day. And, and the devil doesn't just come straight forward and go, this is a giant lie, I hope you buy it. Okay, he sneaks it in, in the middle of partial truths. <clears throat> so as a youth pastor, there was a question that was asked uh, of me quite often. Uh, pastor Jason, is God okay if I get a tattoo? Well, Leviticus 19 says not to. Yeah, but that's Old Testament. Oh, well, Johnny, now we're actually talking about how the Mosaic Old Testament law transfers into the New Testament and how Jesus is the fulfillment of the ceremonial portions of the law. So, can I get a tattoo? And would you mind talking to my mom for me about it? All right, so this morning, my aim is for us to answer this larger question. How are we to understand how the old covenant law transfers into the new covenant? Because as we will see, there is congruence, that is, there is sameness, but there is incongruence. That is, some things have been radically changed. Last week, we are walking through the narrative of Acts chapter 15, right? And, and we came upon this question and we were able to deal with it in part. And I don't have time to re-preach that sermon, but I would tell you if you weren't here, can I, can I press you? Go back and listen to that sermon because it's a major theological hinge of the entire New Testament about this very question. Very, it's massive theological implications. But that topic is important enough for us to set aside the book of Acts this morning and to camp at, look at it again, and to try and do it holistically. How does the law transfer from the Old Testament into the New Testament? <clears throat> Answering that question, as you move further and further right, you run into legalism. Pastor Daniel grew up in a very legalistic home under Bill Gothard particular teaching. And uh, they, they, his family still suffers a lot of the consequences from that to this day. Very legalistic, a lot of rules. There was no TV allowed in the home, no contraception, women 
uh, could not wear pants and had to have long hair. In fact, there, there was a particular uh, haircut list that was given. You, you had to have an approved haircut off the list. Men could not have beards. You had to be clean shaven. And the whole family had to be up at 5.30 for mandatory family devotionals. Okay? And on Sundays, it was nothing but church. Okay? Anything, it, I mean, it's a holy day set aside for the Lord, and therefore you're not allowed to do anything else. And so there's Daniel as a young kid sitting on the couch, not able to play with his friends. But my friends are playing, they're riding bikes in the neighborhood. Yeah, but if they're not keeping the Sabbath, are they even saved? You see this prideful, legalistic set of really pharisaical rules applied with rigidity to uh, keeping the Sabbath day and doing that on Sunday. As, as if, you understand the Sabbath is the Saturday in the Old Testament, the Mosaic law. As if you can just take the Saturday and move it to the Sunday and then just transfer all the laws. In fact, did you know that historically in the early church, they, uh, when, they, when the early church began to meet on Sundays, they met early in the morning or after work in the evening, okay? The Romans had a, a 10-day calendar week that they kept. And it, it's not like a slave, a Christian slave who's, who's at the bottom of the rung can like say, listen, if I'm gonna keep working here, I need to have every Sunday off for you. That's not how it worked, okay? It wasn't until the fifth century underneath the, the Roman uh, uh, Catholic Church that, that the church had authority to uh, move and, and then they, they treated Sunday as a rest day. Now on the completely opposite side, over there if you go far enough right, you run into legalism and if you go far enough left, you run into the idea that Christians are under no law, only grace. There is no constraints. In fact, as Andy Stanley said uh, just a short time ago, that Christians need to unhitch from the Old Testament, right? Let's just wad it up and throw it away. Now, some practical application on how this comes out in our verbiage is there was a family that was uh, a couple seasons ago looking to join the church and uh, their son had recently come out as gay and they wanted to meet with me. And so I, I met with them and they wanted to find out how their son would be treated. Now with that, I, as tenderly and compassionately as a pastor, I said, listen, your son's gonna be treated with kindness and love, the same that we would treat anyone else. And if you need resources or helps or counseling, if there's anything we can do to help you and to equip you or him on this journey, we would be happy to do so. But then she pressed further. She said, I, no, 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 I wanna know, are you going to affirm him in his homosexuality? No, ma'am. I'm, I'm not. He is going to hear that God's word speaks plainly and says, if you act upon same-sex attraction, that is a sin. Yeah, but that's Old Testament law, right? The Old Testament's filled with genocide and child sacrifice, all sorts of horrors. We prefer to to focus on Jesus and love and do not judge. Now, without going into the particulars of that conversation, I do want you to think about, right? I want you to hear the common line of argument. And that is that Old Testament is bad. 
And it, there was lots of death, and there's law, and there's lots of confusing stuff. And the New Testament, well, that's good and filled with God's grace and love, and do not judge. Now, this morning, my aim for us is to build guardrails on both sides of this question, okay? In theology, a balance, you have to understand there are ditches on both sides of the road. If you come up far enough over here, we need to build a guardrail against legalism that points you back to the freedom that, that you will not find in legalism. But over here, you must build the guardrail of lawlessness and back to the freedom of actually being able to walk with God, okay? So with that, 1 Corinthians chapter nine. Listen to verses 19 through 23. Paul writes, for though I am free from all men, I have made myself a slave to all so that I might win more. To the Jews I become as a Jew so that I might win Jews. To those who are under the law, as under the law, though not being myself under the law, so that I might win those who are under the law. To those who are without law, as without law, though not being without the law of God, but under the law of Christ, so that I might win those who are without law. To the weak I become weak, that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all men, so that I may by all means save some. I do all things for the sake of the gospel, so that I may become a fellow partaker of it. Will you pray with me? Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word this morning. We pray that your spirit would allow me to communicate with clarity clarity of thought and mind to be able to express that and that your spirit would teach each of us, each of us on such a broad subject. I know all across this room there are those who tend and, and have been hurt and burned by legalism, by, by rules that are, are binding and hurtful. But on the other end, by those who, who have tried to throw off all constraint and follow their heart. God, I pray that you would help us to think clearly and rightly and well this morning. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So we'll start on, on the left side, okay? I want you to walk through this passage because in this passage, he, he goes over here and then he goes over here and he sets up those guardrails. So look at verse 20. Sorry, on the far right side, legalism. Verse 20, to the Jews, I become as a Jew so that I might win Jews. To those who are under the law, as under the law though not being myself under the law, so that I might win those who are under the law. You know, Timothy was from the small town of Lystra, and he had a Greek father and a Jewish mother. And as Paul went through there on his first missionary journey, Paul led him to faith, right? He preached the gospel and Timothy got saved. And Timothy, uh, uh, Paul had a special connection with Timothy so that the next time Paul came through to Lystra on a second missionary journey, he asked Timothy to come with him. Now, knowing that, that Timothy had a Greek father and a Jewish mother, but that Paul was gonna go from synagogue to synagogue to synagogue, Paul took Timothy and had him circumcised so that Timothy would be able to go into those synagogues with him. To the Jews, I become as a Jew so that I might win Jews. Acts 21 records for us that Paul himself took a Nazarite vow as described in Numbers chapter six. 
Now this is a holy consecration of limiting certain food and drink, okay? Nothing that came from the grapevine, so no wine, but also no eating grapes. And no razor should touch his head or his beard, and, and all sorts of cleanliness laws. Why? To those who are under the law, I become as if I am under the law, so that I might win those who are under the law. Though not being myself under the law. Paul, in this, uh, in this sentence here, he's going, you, you understand. I'm acting so that I can win them. I'm meeting them where they are. But I myself am not under the law of Moses. In verse 21, instead he will say, I am under the law of Christ, not Moses, We came to the same conclusion last week in Acts chapter 15, when the Jerusalem council stated, guys, the gospel is free to go into new cultures, into new areas without the burden of asking people that they need to become customarily Jewish. In fact, the New Testament repeats these statements. The author of Hebrews, when speaking about the new covenant, And what happens with the old states it like this. In chapter eight, verse 13, when he set a new covenant, he made the first obsolete. But whatever is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to disappear. Now, I'm gonna show you here in just a moment the finer details of exactly how this works, okay? In one sense, the New Testament does say that uh, the old covenant is obsolete, that it, is di- that it has disappeared. But I would tell you pastorally, it is more appropriate for us to think in terms of fulfilled, that the Old Testament, the Mosaic law has been fulfilled in Christ. Listen to Matthew five seventeen. Do not think that I came to abolish the law. This is Jesus talking or the prophets. I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest letter or stroke shall pass from the law until all is accomplished. Now as you walked in this morning, you should have grabbed or been handed one of these sheets, okay? If you didn't, you can pick one up on your way out. I gave this to you, there's so much content this week that I wanted to put in your hands the notes, that way you're not trying to frantically uh, write things down, okay? I wanted to give you the final answer. This is the answer to the test. So you can take it home and you can have it. It's folded for you so you can stick it in your Bible and you can keep it. But I wanna explain to you real quick some categories for how you're to understand the Old Testament transfers into the new. First, let's look at the category of worship. So in the Old Testament, there are, uh, there are particulars and requirements to worship. You had to worship at the temple because God's presence was there. But at the temple, God had all sorts of things ironed out, right? Very specifics because he is a holy God, okay? So you you had to worship at the temple in Jerusalem and you had to bring sacrifices and you had to worship through the Levitical priesthood and you could only go so far, okay? And you had to dress a certain way. There were particular washings that you had to, and you had to keep the annual calendar festivals each year that you had to three times a year. You had to pilgrimage to Jerusalem, to that temple. And there were things that you could do that would make you unclean, that would make you unfit for worship. You couldn't even come to worship if you had touched a dead body, if, you're, if you had a skin disease, if you had any sort of blood or discharge. All of those things make you ceremonially unclean, unable to even approach in worship, okay? And God is the one who set all of, things, all of those things up. So none of this is bad. This is God declaring and teaching you and, and, uh, that he is holy, that he is separate, that he is other. There is no one like him. But then I want you to notice in the chart, right? I want you to notice 
that when Jesus comes, Jesus is the fulfillment of all these things. In fact, all of these things point to Jesus. So Jesus, John uh, 1.14, Jesus shows up and it says, the word became flesh and tabernacled amongst us. And then Jesus uh, stood in the temple courtyard and said, destroy this temple and I will rebuild it in three days. What was he saying? He's saying, I am the temple. Why? Because God's presence is now with the Son of God. And and as you walk through, uh, Jesus changes everything. He's the fulfillment. Everything has been pointing to him. Okay, and so he's the ultimate sacrifice. Jesus is the ultimate high priest who now sits at the Father's right hand and and bids us to come. Uh, He is the fulfillment of all the festivals, right? So you can think of like the Passover lamb, okay? How you're to take the blood and put it on the doorpost. And yet the New Testament says that Jesus is our Passover lamb. And everything in Jesus's ministry, if you were unclean, and you touch Jesus, you didn't make Jesus unclean, he made you clean, okay? Jesus made, like he could touch a dead body and raise it from the dead, okay? Jesus makes you clean. And then every one of these categories finds a further fulfillment now on the other side of Christ. So let's take the temple, right? The temple used to be in Jerusalem on top of the mountain there because that's where God's presence was. But then Jesus showed up as the temple, right? He's the presence of God. But now where is the temple? It's in his people because his spirit indwells us. And so the location... How do you gather together and worship? Is it, is it in this building? Does God promise to meet us in this building? No, it's wherever God's people gather together. Okay, so you have this entire chart because I want you to see that these Old Testament categories are fulfilled in Christ, but then they move and they have a different application on the other side. Next, I want to show you, look at the very bottom of this page, a helpful paradigm for you to understand how the Mosaic law transfers. This paradigm, okay, even though these terms are not used within the scripture, it's very helpful to think like this, that there are three components of the law. There's the ceremonial aspect of the law, there's the civil law, and there's the moral law. And the ceremonial aspects of the law, that's the story of worship that I just described to you. Okay? The, the things that you had to do in order to approach God in worship. But all of those things pointed to Christ. And now that Christ has come, you can see that the fulfillment and the outworking of those things is now completely different. Like I said, God's spirit indwells us. Okay? And, and Christ has made you clean. And no longer consider unclean what God has cleansed. And so the ceremonial aspects of the law have been done away with. But the civil law, civil law had to do with uh, nations and and laws uh, surrounding Israel as a nation. So if, if you accidentally gore your neighbor's ox, do this. Or in every city, you're supposed to set up a sanctuary cities so that uh, someone can have a fair trial as, as they're, they're fleeing their land, okay? So things like that. Now, what do you do with those things? Well, the general principle still applies. We're no longer setting up a nation, but now in the New Testament, we have become a spiritual people. So there's this transition between we're not nation building, rather we are a spiritual people. And because of that, you take the general principle from the civil part of the law, okay? It still applies. But the moral aspects of the law directly applies like adultery and murder and do not steal. In fact, when you listen to Jesus' teaching, he strengthens that part. He says, look, you've heard that it's been said, but I say, you've heard that it's said, don't commit adultery, but I say to you, anyone who lusts after a woman has already committed adultery in his heart. See, Jesus presses that aspect. So the more aspects of the law directly applies. 
So, listen again to the guardrail I'm putting up right here. Against legalism, because you are not under the law of Moses. For though I am free from all men, I have made myself a slave to all so that I might win more. To the Jews I become as a Jew, so that I might win Jews. To those who are under the law, as if I'm under the law but not myself being under the law, so that I might win those who under the law. Okay, so the guardrail on the right side against legalism, okay, is a guardrail that says the gospel has freed you from ritual piety. And the gospel has a freedom to cross cultural boundaries, no longer bound by ritual customs, but rather the gospel meets people where they are, okay? And if Christ has cleaned you, then you are clean, and there is a freedom of worship, okay? Whoever and wherever and whenever, and our whole lives are lived as worship because the Spirit of God indwells us. And you and I are able to approach the heavenly throne because the great high priest sits at the Father's right hand and bids us to come. So think about this access now, the freedom of worship that me, who am I, can hit my knees wherever, camping, and enter into the throne room of God in prayer, and he hears us. Amen? There's a freedom. But now, let's think about this side, okay? Think about the lawless left. Look at verse 21. To those who are without law, as without law, Though not being without the law of God, but under the law of Christ, so that I might win those who are without law. You see, Paul has this freedom to cross cultural boundaries, right? He can eat like a Gentile and dress like a Gentile and and live as without law. That doesn't mean he's without law. It's not as if God has no restraints on Christians, right? That freedom in Christ means that you can now steal and kill people while you're at it. No. He is still under the law of Christ. So what does that mean? What does the law of Christ mean? Well, that's the new covenant, And you see it as it's worked out in the writings of the New Testament. It's the teachings of Jesus and the apostles. I've already showed you some of those large Old Testament categories and how they're fulfilled in the transfer, but you could also look at summary statements by Jesus where he says, listen, you wanna know how to summarize the law? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. I want you to notice that the Bible's use of freedom is not what our culture means by freedom. We're about to get real relevant here, okay? You following me? When Paul says that he is without law, right? That, oh, he's free. He does not mean free to do whatever he wants. In fact, That's exactly what he says in Galatians 5, 17. So in Galatians chapter five, you can go home and you can study this, but he's been talking about how the Christian still has the flesh inside of them, okay? Do you guys know what he means by that term, the flesh? The flesh is your base primal drives for self-gratification. It's that dark underbelly in all of us that is still corrupt in nature, all right? It feels natural to us to pursue these passions even though they're sinful and wrong, to indulge in what we shouldn't, to overindulge 
in what is good. To get lazy and choose comfort and apathy over what is right. Now, you may have thought that when you first came to Christ, that all of those desires would completely disappear. Did anyone have that thought? Right? And you kind of thought, this accepting Jesus thing didn't work. Why didn't they all just vanish? Why didn't they all disappear? Listen, you were not freed from all temptation. Rather, you have been freed to fight temptation. That's the way the the New Testament would speak. You have now been freed in order to fight. You can choose what is right now. But I'm getting ahead of myself. The truth is, is that flesh is in conflict with the Spirit of God. And that is what is inside every Christian. The Spirit of God and the flesh. And they are at war. So Paul's instructions in Galatians 5.17 is do not simply do whatever you want. But doing whatever you want is exactly how the modern self describes freedom. That's exactly how our culture describes freedom. Our culture believes that in order for someone to be happy, we must have the freedom to explore, indulge, and express our true self. Our culture's highest value is authenticity. We are told that in every movie, every Disney cartoon, every song, every YouTube video, be your authentic, true self. And if you don't, you're a fraud. Okay, you're a fraud. You need to be living out your internal desires. Now, like all lies, there's partial truth in there in very dangerous packaging. We are no longer a culture that is built upon the authority of truth and God's word Right? Where our highest aims are being holy and, and following after God and honor. Instead, now it's all about your truth and never repress desires. You know this teaching is straight from the godless man Freud, okay, who taught. You know, you know the reason you're not happy? You're allowing other people to tell you what to do. If you could name and do anything you wanted, you'd be happy. Doesn't that sound just like Genesis 3? Right? Just name your own truth. You get to do that. You want to be happy? Follow your heart. And when it leads you to a twisted place, then simply say, well... The heart wants what the heart wants. Do you know the scandalous story behind that saying, the heart wants what the heart wants? So Woody Allen, you guys know Woody Allen? Woody Allen was in a long, uh, long relationship with the beautiful actress Mia Farrow for, for 12 years Okay, and they were kind of like the Brady Bunch as far as an eclectic group. They had one biological child and they adopted two together, but before they got together, Mia had herself adopted a couple of children, okay? Well, as it happens, in 1992, it came out that Woody left Mia for one of her adopted children. Soon Yi. He was 56. She was 22. So stepfather that had began at the age of 10 was now lover. Now this was a scandal in 1992. I'm not sure if any longer it would be a scandal. Okay. But back then, 
a journalist sits down with Woody and begins the conversation, and he's skirting around it. He, he would not admit any wrongdoing, and the journalist just begins to press him. And out comes this iconic line, the heart wants what the heart wants. You know, there's no logic to those things. You meet someone and you fall in love and that's that. You see, the new locus of authority in the Western culture is the self. To quote Shakespeare's Hamlet, this above all, to thine own self be true. Never mind that that line is uttered by the fool in Hamlet. By the fool. Because for thousands of years, humans have known that to be controlled by your passions is to be enslaved by them and unable to choose the higher virtues. Shakespeare's audience heard that line and automatically said to themselves, you moron, okay? Everyone knows that that's a recipe for disaster. And yet our culture hears that and gets a tattoo. (laughs) And where has this left us? Overwhelmed, anxious, and fearful. Because truth is not inside of you. It comes from your creator. It comes from your creator. Truth is not inside of you. In fact, do you know the only way that you can answer the fear and confusion and turmoil in your life is with the truth of God's word. That's how you answer it. Galatians 5.13 For you were called to freedom, brethren, only do not turn your freedom into an opportunity of the flesh. Can I quickly summarize for you the the way that Paul writes here in Galatians and in Romans 6, 7, and 8, the way that he speaks about this, this large category? Do you not understand that your flesh is hostile to God? Do you not understand that you have a part of you that cannot please God? Okay? And When it leads you to sin, it enslaves you in sin, right? It is actually mastering over you. And it produces shame and awful consequences. But on top of that, guess what? It produces more sin. It doesn't scratch the itch and stop. It tightens the shackles. Why are you playing around with the kingdom of darkness that hates you and wants to wreck you and your family and lead it to absolute chaos and death? Do we not see what Satan's lies are doing in our culture? Beloved, Jesus died the death that sin requires in order to free you, to set you free. Do you not realize that because the spirit of God resides in you that you've actually been set free? You've been set free to choose now what is right. You've been set free to choose what, you you couldn't before, but you can now choose what is right. He has ripped out a heart of stone and put a heart of flesh that now frees you to choose the desires of God. And here's the deal. If you are a Christian, your deepest desire is to walk and to follow Christ. Christ. But in the moment, it may not feel like your deepest desire, right? In the moment, the flesh presses you and it it feels like you desire something else. But the scripture says, you have been set free, right? So wake up every day and choose to present yourself to the spirit of God. 
and you will not follow the desires of the flesh. You have been set free to fight. Guys, do you see the massive difference the way the Bible describes freedom and the way our world and culture want to describe freedom? The world says freedom is, is freedom from any constraints, freedom to do whatever I want. As if freedom to put water in the gas tank of your car is any freedom. Or a fish to say, you know what, I am free to flop around on dry ground. As if that's real freedom. But biblical freedom, guys, is not freedom from, it's freedom to. Freedom to a person. To a relationship, intimacy of knowing and walking with God. And the Bible says you now have the ability to choose that, to abide in him. And catch this, intimacy of relationship is the most constraining law in the universe. Now, I love my wife. I love my wife. Sometimes it's easiest to let country music explain what I mean by I love my wife. (laughs) Because it says it's so good. You guys know Brad Paisley's song, And I Thought I Loved You Then? It walks through their relationship and seasons of life and he, he gets to a new moment and his heart explodes with love that he never thought possible. And he looks back and he says, oh, I thought I loved you then, but I'm at new heights now. That's the best way I can describe 20 years of being married to my wife. Amen. Right, you go through these seasons where you're like, I love her as much as humanly possible. But then through the birth of our kids and through different seasons after 20 years, honest to God, I look back and go, man, I thought I loved you then. And you say, oh, that is so sweet. (laughs) You know what you naturally understand about the kind of love that I'm describing? that there are constraints. In fact, it's massively constraint, isn't it? When you hear me talk about her, you know, I don't get to do whatever I want. I lead my heart towards her, towards affection. Because there are so often times my heart is, it's wanders. Real love has constraints. You don't get to do whatever you want. So now think about that with Christ, okay? There is a guardrail against the indulgence of the flesh. It is not lawlessness, but rather there is freedom to pursue Christ. So there's a guardrail on this side against lawlessness. And there's a guardrail on this side against legalism. You guys know the purpose of guardrails? It's to keep you from harm, right? To keep you from driving off a bridge and killing yourself. And it sets up there as a boundary and gives you the freedom to run in the middle. So in closing, all right, here's here's what I want you to leave with, right? As we've set up these guardrails, it is not lawlessness, it is to Christ. It is not legalism, there is freedom to Christ. That Christ is fulfilled. And Christ has put us under his law. And he is our savior and he is our king and he is our delight and he has set up these boundaries so that we can know and chase him to relationship, to relationship. And the scripture begs you over and over again, do not understand the spirit of God is inside of you. 
So now you can choose Christ and know him more deeply and intimately than ever before. This is us. This is us. Okay? This is where all that theology leads, right? Why we have to set all this stuff up? Because at the end of the day, all of that theology leads to, now I can discern truth against the culture, but now I can see my Lord and Savior clearly. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. Teach us, teach us to guard against legalism and to guard against the lies of culture, of licentiousness and lawlessness, but to see you and to realize you are our delight. You are our delight. And we worship you in freedom and truth. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. As the praise team comes and leads us in a final song, church family, you are invited to respond, okay? To to shore up that landing spot, right? With all the theology. If you hear one thing here, that those guardrails help us to pursue Christ. They give us the freedom to pursue Christ. So if the Spirit of God has spoken to you in a particular way this morning, I pray that you have the freedom to respond. We have ministers down here at the front who would love to pray with you. I'll be down here. If you've never accepted Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, do you know you can right now? Do you know you can be set free from shame and guilt by believing and trusting that He accomplished all of the work for you on the cross? And if you would, by faith, place your trust in him, you could be set free. If you want to use these steps or the stage as an altar to pour out your heart before the Lord, I pray that you would feel that you have the freedom to do that too. Whatever decision the Spirit of God has placed upon your heart, you be obedient.